I will admit to going back and forth a little bit debating whether or not to even make this video. Um, it's not really so much a lab conversation, it's, it's a very theoretical sort of thing that I want to cover. But um, since we've lost the last couple of labs and I promised you a couple of videos, I figured I'd just make this one last one. Okay, so a week ago Ron talked about dynamic braking and he went through um, the, um, the control circuit and, and the concept of, of introducing uh, a resistor across the armature to provide braking. Um, he talked about dissipating the energy from the motor and I kind of want to go back and revisit that idea. Um, so Jay, way earlier in the term, would have taught you the theory about uh, DC motors and generators, so I'm assuming he's covered this. This is probably just review, but I'm, uh, I'm just going to have some fun, throw out this video, um, give you guys your little quiz. I'll try to remember to drop a couple of Easter eggs here and you can prove to me you watch the video and that will conclude the term for us. Okay, so the conversation ultimately is about dynamic braking, but it's going to take a while for us to get to that point. Okay, I want to start the conversation right here. This is the understanding that helps us make sense of all of this. And that is that we talk about the DC machine. This course is actually called DC rotating machines. Well, why do we call it a machine? Why don't we call it a motor? Okay, well, because we also spend some time talking about generators. And so the motors and the generators collectively are referred to as the rotating machines. And, and we can use that generic term machine because the motor and the generator are the same thing. When you go through the construction, you talk about the armature and you talk about the commutator and the brushes. Okay, the DC generator and the DC motor are the very same piece of equipment. It's just a question of what kind of energy you're putting in and what kind of energy you're getting out. In the case of a motor, we're applying the electrical energy and we get mechanical energy, torque, as an output. Okay, on the other hand, a generator, we're providing that mechanical energy, we're providing that torque, we're rotating the shaft of the machine, that's called the prime mover, and the, the cutting action, the induction that takes place inside results in an output of electrical energy. Okay, so mechanical energy in, electrical energy out for a generator, electrical energy in, mechanical energy out for a motor. Okay, same piece of equipment. Okay, let's take that one step further and understand that, that one, whatever it may be, while it's operating is actually trying to be the other. Okay, that's the real key here that brings dynamic braking into focus. Okay, so let's move away from the motor entirely. I want to start the conversation with the generator. Okay, and let me start drawing some pictures. Okay, so here we have our two pole pieces. I'm going to draw this and immediately erase it, but we need some perspective. Two pole pieces. Okay, shaft of the machine, and then around the machine, around the armature, we have all of our armature windings. We're going to focus right in, and we're just going to look at, we're going to draw circles, okay, and we're going to say these circles represent the wires which make up the armature winding. Okay, and they do just very, very simplified. Okay, this is the shaft. Okay, so there's the big picture, but now I'm going to zoom in. All right, we're going to ignore all the rest of it, and we're going to come in and we're going to focus on this space right here. Okay, so we're just going to come in and zoom in on this. So let's do that. I'm actually going to erase my title because we're not even talking about dynamic braking right now. Okay, so there's the one pole piece and just one piece of wire which makes up all of the armature windings in the armature. Okay, um, so that I can use my left hand, I think I want my lines of flux going that way, which means they travel north to south externally. This is going to be the south pole, okay, and that makes this the north pole over here near the uh, outside housing of the motor, okay, which means we have lines of flux. Right here. Okay, so, so there we go. We need the main field to exist for anything to work, whether it's a motor generator, it doesn't matter, that has to be there. Okay, now let's talk about a generator. So, so that means 
we are going to have a prime mover, some form of mechanical energy input into the motor, okay? Which is going to cause, let's pick a direction, which is going to cause this armature winding to rotate up through those lines of flux, okay? So the armature is going to be rotating counterclockwise, okay? Time for our Fleming's generator hand rule. This cutting action is going to cause a generated voltage. So there are the lines of flux. There's the cutting action of the conductor. There is the current that's going to get pushed by the induced voltage as a result of that cutting action. So the generator is going to produce a voltage with a polarity to push current in that direction. Okay? There you go. The generator. Done. That's, you, you already knew that. Okay? Here's the part that I want to focus on. Okay? I'm sure you've noticed this, if you've, ever, if you've ever used a generator, you've gone camping, taken a generator with you, if you happen to have used power tools on a construction site that's being fed by a generator, you know this, that as soon as you turn on that electrical load, as soon as you ask that generator to provide you with power, it works harder. You can hear it bog down. Most generators will, will rev up. They'll kick into a higher gear to provide enough torque from the prime mover, the, 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 the engine, gas-powered engine, which is the prime mover, which causes this rotation to take place in the cutting action, and we induce a voltage. Now, why is that? Okay, here's the question. Why does a generator have to work harder when you put an electrical load on it? And the answer is, how much current is there in this circuit? So, so the armature is the power supply providing power to the load, and how much current flows through here is a question of how much current the load is demanding. Well, let's use another uh, hand rule that you would have learned about magnetism, which is every time there's current through a conductor, there's a magnetic field around that conductor. The armature field, we've talked about it lots, I've used that term a hundred times. Left hand, there's the direction of the current, there's the direction of the armature field. The direction of the magnetic field created by this current. Well, look at this. Parallel lines of flux in the same direction repel, and parallel lines of flux in the opposite direction unite, pull together. And so the force here, as a result of the interaction of these two magnetic fields, is in that direction. It's pushing back against the prime mover. Okay, The greater the electrical demand on the generator, the larger this current, the more armature field we have, the greater the pushback against the prime mover. And your generator bogs down. It has to work harder to provide that electrical energy. Okay. We call this, this right here, this force pushing back against the prime mover, we call that motor action. This is a generator, but it's trying to be a motor. The interaction of the two magnetic fields are trying to drive that motor in a particular direction. We call it motor action in a generator. It's pushing back against the prime mover. Okay, let's start over. That's, that's the generator. That's why a generator works harder when you, when you put it under load. Okay, let's get rid of a bunch of stuff here. Okay, so the lines of flux are going to remain exactly the same. Okay, now it's a motor. And so what's the input energy? It's electrical energy. So we are now going to put that current on, let's, let's do the same thing. Okay, that is, that is no longer current resulting from the induced voltage. That is now the current that we're providing to the motor from our power supply. Okay, so that's the current that's going to drive this motor forward. So there, I could have left this here, I suppose. I hadn't really decided how I was going to go like this. There's the armature field. So now this is a motor. Here's the interaction of our two magnetic fields. We have the main field. Now we have the armature field and we have the pushing and the pulling of those two magnetic fields and that's going to cause the motor to rotate. Okay, that is what 
drives that motor forward is the pushing and pulling of the two magnetic fields. That's what gives us rotation in our motor. Okay. Now, we've talked a great deal about inrush current and about counter EMF. Okay, Ron's talked about it a number of times about the fact that when you first provide power to a motor, when you first turn it on and it's not rotating, you have a ton of current flow because the only thing limiting current at that point in time is the resistance of the armature winding, okay, which is going to be pretty small. Okay, but as the motor starts to build up speed, you get this thing called counter EMF. Well, where's the counter EMF coming from? Well, here it is. Here we have cutting action as a result of the motor starting to rotate. Well, cutting action means generated voltage. Fleming's left hand generator rule. Again, let's try this. Lines of flux are still in the same direction. Now the cutting action is down through those lines of flux. We are going to get a generated voltage, an induced voltage, which is going to push current in that direction. So I'm going to put small plus signs around the outside to indicate that there's current being, being pushed in that direction by the generated voltage. Except that there's not really because it's always overpowered by this. And so now here's Ron's conversation many times about, there's a vector that is the applied applied voltage and its polarity is creating that current flow which is creating the magnetic field which is driving that motor forward okay but as a result of that rotation we now get cutting action and the cutting action is creating an induced voltage back in the other direction okay induced voltage and in a motor we call that counter emf different name same thing induced voltage generated voltage counter emf they are all the same thing they are creating or they are pushing current as a result of a cutting action. And so initially there's no counter EMF. And so the effective voltage is the applied voltage. As the speed of the cutting action increases, as the motor ramps up to speed, we get more and more counter EMF and we're left with less and less, and, he, and this is referred to as effective, effective voltage. And we call it the effective voltage because that is what affects the amount of current flowing through the armature. Okay? And there must always be some because we always need a little bit, at least a little bit of magnetic field to continue to create that pushing and pulling that drives the motor onward. Okay? But we get the applied voltage cancelled out by the induced voltage, leaving us with however little bit of effective voltage we need to keep going. All of this to finally get to the point. Now let's talk about braking. Okay? Because what happens when, when we apply the brake, for starters, the first thing we do is we remove the power supply. So, say goodbye to the applied voltage. Okay? Say goodbye to that dot representing current flowing in the, this direction, which means say goodbye to this field. Okay, what we're left with, okay, that means we have no longer any effective voltage. Okay. What we have is the counter EMF. Okay, so I can now focus in on these dots right here. And there is the current resulting from the generated voltage. Now here's the thing, all the labs that we've built when we press stop, all we do is we remove the power supply and the motor coasts to a stop. Okay, what do we need in order for current to flow? We need a complete circuit. All we've done is we've just taken the power away and that's it. So there is no, there is no current resulting from the induced voltage. Okay. So what we need to do, and what Ron showed you in the circuits, is that when we remove the power supply, we then place a resistor across the armature, A1 and A2. Create a complete circuit so that, I'll draw these plus signs back in here, so that this current can flow. Okay, complete the circuit, put a resistor in there, allow current to flow, and now, what happens when we have current flow? We have a magnetic field. Current's flowing that way, magnetic field is going that way, 
which means the armature field is there. And look, this is our rotation, okay, our prime mover. This is, this is just turned into a generator. We just took our motor and we made it a generator. What is the prime mover of our generator? Every generator needs a prime mover. It is the momentum of the rotation of the motor, okay? And we have opposite, okay, lines of flux parallel in the opposite direction, they're going to attract. Parallel lines in the same direction, they're going to repel, which means the motor action in this generator is against the prime mover. Okay, the prime mover is momentum. The motor action is the braking force. You put a very large resistor in there, which means it's going to allow very little current flow. You get very little braking action. Okay, you don't include a resistor at all. You just short circuit out the two armatures, the two armature uh, connections, A1 and A2. You get a massive amount of current flow which gives you a huge armature field, which gives you a huge braking force, and you come to a dead stop incredibly fast and probably break stuff in the process. Not to mention burn stuff out because of the amount of current that just flowed through your circuit. Okay? But the, the braking action is, is a result of the fact that this motor, the whole time, okay, apply voltage, Okay, induced voltage and effective voltage, the whole time that motor is operating, it is trying very hard to be a generator. Okay, trying very hard. That's what all of this counter EMF is. Okay, all you have to do to apply the brake is allow it to be a generator. Okay, remove the power from the motor, put a load across the armature so the current can flow, and just let that generator be the generator that it wants to be. And you get motor action which is your braking force. So it was, it was kind of this that I felt I wanted to touch on. I wanted to, to, to kind of pull the curtain back and remove the magic. And, and Ron spent time talking about, you know, you have to dissipate the energy from the motor to apply the brake. Well, what does that mean and how does that work? And, and this, this is how that works, okay? We get those two fields pushing and pulling against each other against the momentum of the motor and that applies the brake.